This is Trent Bolt. And you remember recently that he knocked back his international contract so he could play more franchise cricket. That made a big splash. But at the same time, a smaller but just as interesting story happened that very few people noticed. A few years ago when I started checking stats for spinners who opened the bowling in T20, I got a surprising number back. The bowler I had seen deliver heaps of overs up front had in fact only ever bowled two of them. Clearly something was wrong. And it turned out I made the same mistake I often do, mixing up names. Anyone with a similar name is almost instantly mixed together in my brain forever, which was a bit of a problem when I was younger, but now that I cover a sport with 4,000 professionals in it, it's not ideal. Chris Lynn has only ever bowled two overs in a T20 power play. But what I'm really trying to say is that Chris Green has one of those names that could easily be confused, at least by me. And just to prove this is not a narrative device, here I am on the Beyond the Crease podcast making that same mistake. And there's a great recent example, and I think he's played in the PSL, a guy called Chris Lim, who... Yeah, he has. Yeah, he, he, um, sorry, I did it wrong. I always say Chris Lim. Oh my God. <laughs> I just done a whole video explaining how I always say the wrong name. Chris Green. Sorry. Oh Chris yes, Green. Chris Green. You may think that's not a great excuse for me confusing him with another Chris with a surname ending in an N. Even now, six years after that, when I say Chris Green's name out loud... I actually have to stop and think to myself if I've actually said, sorry, I did it wrong. I always say Chris Lynn. Oh my God. I just done a whole video <laughs> explaining how I always say the wrong name. Chris Green. Sorry. Oh Chris yes, Green. Chris Green. He has. Multan, I think. He played for yeah. Multan. All spinners, he's delivered the eighth most balls in T20 power plays. This is the list of all the spinners who've delivered over a thousand balls in that period of the game. It's a fairly exclusive club. And almost every bowler here, you will instantly know who they are. You probably know every name here except for Chris Green. In fact, the only way that you know who he is is if you follow the Big Bash a lot or you're a real T20 head. I'd say he's by far the least known cricketer of anyone on this list. I mean, you're talking about a player who has played one game in the IPL and you probably missed that one. The truth is that Chris Green is nowhere near a star level player. So let me just give you a little bit more information about him. He was born in South Africa, but moved to Australia when he was still a kid. As a bowler, he never really fit into the Australian thinking either. A defensive off-spinner is not really what we do there. But it turned out he was incredibly good as a spoiler bowler. Of all the people who've delivered more than 3,000 balls since the start of 2014, he has the ninth best economy. And you might look at this and wonder why you don't know him. But for all the talk about people being smarter in T20, there is still a bias against some things in the market. And especially in Asia, most teams just think they can find a better local finger spinner than anyone outside of Asia. And on top of that, Green has batting, but perhaps never enough consistently to really move the needle. The last five years, he's been good enough to at least moonlight as a number seven on occasion. But in the middle of him actually improving his batting, in one year, he actually managed to still average only seven. In the last two years, he's averaged 16 while striking 135. It's not nothing, but it's also not quite enough to inspire teams to see him as an all-rounder. A lot of people in T20 cricket also talk about three-tool players, which is something that is stolen directly from baseball. And Green does have a third dimension. Compared to most finger spinners, he's an excellent fielder. In fact, compared to most players, he is. He's a brilliant athlete, but again, as good as he is at fielding, maybe it's not enough to quite move the needle. And for all this, I'm really talking about him as a overall franchise player. But as a domestic player, you could see why he's an absolutely star combination. And because of that, the Sydney Thunder gave him a six-year contract. It was the longest in Big Bash history at the time, and it would have to be probably one of the longest in any franchise in the world. It's just not something we see in cricket that often. And when he was offered that contract, he'd played two seasons in the CPL, he played in the Blast for Warwickshire, and also a couple of PSL games. And so it looked like with his long contract in Australia, and with all these other contracts coming through, he was about to have a major breakout. But less than two months after he got that six-year deal from the Sydney Thunder, he was called for throwing. It was plea an overdue call. His action had deteriorated a fair bit. So none of this was a surprise because his action was never that clean to begin with. In fact, the two bowlers he was most compared to were often Johan Bota and Sun on their own, both of which also had their own issues with being called. And he also has a kind of relationship with both of them. Of course, that call did dampen how teams thought of him, and more importantly, as you would expect, when he came back, his numbers weren't the same. Although weirdly, unlike most off-spinners when they come back from being chucking, his numbers were actually quite good right after he was called. That was on the 3rd of January 2020. He didn't bowl professionally again until August of that year, and he had really good numbers. 
But since then, he's just not been as good a bowler. However, he's still the same mid-level franchise player, continue to play in the CPL and the Blast, but he's not as economical or striking as much as he did before he was called. This is the list of the most used bowlers in T20 cricket, and he is right up there in terms of economy since the start of his career. And while he is extremely far from being a strike bowler, this is the cluster you find bowlers like Akshar Patel and R. Ashwin. But if you isolate his numbers in the last two years, you can see that now he's in the middle on economy, and even his average has jumped up quite a bit as well. And so what you have at this point is an Australia spoiler off spinner who has been called for throwing bats a little bit, but maybe not consistently, and wasn't that sexy as a player. I mean, he is as boring as batshit to watch. In cricket terms, he's as sexy as semi-skim milk. And now his numbers were starting to slip as well. Not enough to ruin his career, but at least enough to limit his options. And at this point, Chris Green was completely a T20 specialist. At one stage, he played 126 straight T20 games without playing in any other professional format. Yeah, that's some record. And that's really why I'm talking about him now. Because you can see at the end, he actually does start to play other formats. I tried to find another play with a similar record to this. It's not as easy a thing to look up as I thought it would be. We have a lot of players doing it later in their career, but not early on. Nicholas Perum was one I thought might be similar because he played three early first class games, then had a falling out with Trinidad over his medical treatment. But later on, he was good enough to play in ODIs and even toyed with tests when playing some four day matches for the West Indies A. But when you have a look at him compared to Perum, Chris Green played 173 professional matches before he appeared in a first class game. And you can see that outside a few list A games to start with, he was basically just playing T20 or nothing else. Because usually, if you're playing a lot of T20 games, you probably still play a couple of one days as well. But it's worth talking about the fact that he waited until his 174th game to make his first class debut. How is he this good and well known within the Australian cricket and never got a game at all? Even if it was just to check if his skills would translate. I mean, there are a bunch of reasons why this never happened. New South Wales actually had a lot to spin. Adam Zampa and Nathan Lyon both had to move to South Australia to get their big breaks. Zampa stayed for a long time, but Lyon came back a lot earlier. And when Lyon was back, he was obviously the first choice off spinner when available, which is a fair bit as he doesn't play Australian white ball cricket. But it wasn't just Lyon. Steve O'Keefe was the other major spinner during that period as well. So you already have two international finger spinners who are ahead of green in the pecking order. But I can actually add another, a New Zealand player. Will Somerville played club cricket in Sydney and was also picked ahead of Green to bowl his off spin for New South Wales. That's a lot of international finger spin ahead of poor Chris Green while he's bowling his darts. The other truth is that the SCG doesn't spin like it once did. This is the test average of spin bowling on this wicket looking at a five game rolling average. It's fair to say that the days of automatically picking two spinners there are well and truly gone. And there's quite a few games over the last couple of years where New South Wales have just gone in with one frontline spinner. And if you look at Chris Green's club stats, it really wasn't until 2016, 2017 when Green was a dead certainty to be picked by the Sydney Thunder with two strong years under his belt. The following year in club cricket, he took 23 wickets and an average of 21. But the problem was now that he wasn't available to play that much two day grade cricket. It wasn't that he failed. There was one year where he only took three wickets at 50, which is of course a fairly small sample size anyway. But over a five year period in club cricket, he took 53 wickets. And in those, he averaged in the low 20s. The average is fine, but 53 wickets in five years of club cricket is not particularly great. It's hard to get much attention on yourself. So essentially, he was typecast, didn't play enough, or couldn't beat the international finger spinners out for a spot. And to be fair, if you just watched him bowl, he just didn't look like someone who would be very good at first class cricket or with the red ball at all. But he has actually played a little bit more with the red ball that comes up in his normal stats. In 2015 and 2018, he played second 11 cricket with Surrey. In 2021, played another game for Middlesex. And when he's not been in a T20 tournament in Canada or in the Caribbean, he's actually played a little bit of club cricket in England as well. It's obviously not the way a normal first class spinner would prepare, but to be fair, Chris Green is not a normal first class spinner. And so Chris Green played 173 white ball professional matches and then suddenly a few months ago, New South Wales selected him for his debut first class match when Adam Zampa was playing ODIs, Nathan Lyon was being rested, and Tanvir Sangha was injured. And like most cricketers of his age, 29, he didn't grow up wanting to be a franchise T20 player. He was 10 when T20 started. When he was young, he was dreaming of a baggy green or the canary yellow strip. He became a T20 player because he was good at it. And once he did that, people paid him a lot and he didn't use the red ball as much. But over the last few years, he never had that huge breakthrough. He hasn't become a major player in the IPL, the PSL, or the 100. And so this is the interesting thing. It means for him, first-class cricket is still going to pay fairly well. 
And at the very least, it gives him other professional offers if T20 doesn't come calling. Now remember, this all happened in the same year that Trent Bolt resigned from his New Zealand contract so he could essentially work directly with the many franchises that Mumbai India will one day buy, or already have bought in some cases. And that was seen as the beginning of the end for Red Bull and national cricket. It wasn't the beginning, of course, because it had been happening for quite some time. Yet when Chris Green suddenly changed career arc after 173 games, it was barely mentioned at all outside of a couple of small articles in Australia. Now that does make sense on a certain level. Even I am still struggling with Chris Green's name. So him making the choice to go away from T20 cricket back towards first class cricket was never going to make the same kind of big news that Trent Bolt had made. But this is quite an interesting moment for where cricket is. Because what it tells us is that for many of these mid-level players who don't get huge contracts and don't get the ability to hop around the world on, you know, Ambani private jets, the allure of freelance is still not as strong as you would think. Things like insurance and medical care are much easier with the contract. And when Green was talking about playing for New South Wales, he was specifically talking about trying to get a contract with them. And the other thing is he's trying to keep his options open. He may not be able to get any blast work in the future, and all he'll be left with is his Sydney Thunder contract. And so for him, it actually makes sense to use first class cricket as a backup plan. The interesting thing is for years, we have been told that players will go where the money is and that they will also adapt to make more money in their career. That is exactly what Chris Green has done here, but he's just done it the opposite way to what the current narrative is. And I don't think Green will be the last player to put all their chips into the T20 basket only for midway through their career to realize that they'd be better off spreading themselves out a little bit more or even just going all in on first class cricket. With the IPL owners buying as many of these leagues as possible and for many of the leagues that they can't buy only having a couple of slots for internationals, is there a possibility that that sort of mid-level talent like Chris Green might actually start to get pushed out of some of these leagues as the IPL owners are using the players that they already use in the IPL? That means there's going to be a lot of very talented T20 players who can't pick up those mid-level contracts anymore. I don't know how many of them will move back towards first-class cricket, or even test cricket in some cases. But players will go where the money is. And while most of the money is in T20 cricket, not all of it is. So of recent times, Chris Green has been back in his happy place, the Big Bash. And it's pretty much business as usual for him. But you probably want to know what happened when he finally played first class cricket. It went pretty well because Chris Green was man of the match on debut with nine wickets. And his victims included Bancroft, Cartwright and Philippi. You know, three international quality players. Green was worth the wait, it would appear. The next game he added another three wickets from limited opportunities. Not bad for a guy who had to wait that long and isn't Chris Lynn, Cameron Green or even Trent Bolt. 